You're listening to Releasing Trauma, a survivor's podcast. And now here's your host, Tracy Osborne. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. We are going to be talking about addiction today, and a lot of it is going to be around the stigma of addiction and recovery. Joining me today is Tara Schiller. She is the CEO and visionary behind Sober Buddy, which is a leading virtual drug and alcohol recovery app um, designed specifically for reducing the stigma around addiction and recovery. So Tara, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm happy to have you. This sounds really interesting um, to, to have an app that helps um, with, with addiction and recovery. So I think I want to just kind of dive right in and, and, you know, tell us what this is. Yeah, for sure. We, we definitely wanted, you know, creating an app, it moves into a new area of how we can get resources for getting sober. Um, and so we really wanted to make something that would bridge that gap in a real way and, and not just be a fluff piece, you know? And so we based everything that we do on the app on evidence-based methods, um, using cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, a lot of proven techniques that have worked um, at higher rates for keeping people sober in the long term. But we also realized that the biggest barrier to getting help for recovery or even entering into that space or getting help for addiction is emotional. You know, it, you know, we think a lot about the physical barrier, you know, is there enough treatment programs? Is there, you know, enough insurance to cover it? But really what we find from research is that, and and really you can just observe it as well, is that um, it's the emotional barrier, the stigma around addiction. But I mean, even even if there was no stigma, having to admit to ourselves that, um, that there's a problem that we lost control over something and it's starting to control us, or that maybe a lot of our emotions we're having are being caused by it, you know, because it feels invalidating. There's a, there's a lot of, a lot going on there. Um, especially for mothers, you know, and, and the reason I bring up mothers specifically is because during the pandemic, that's the group that has increased their alcohol use the most you know, mothers with children under five and, and traditionally the mothers, um, we'll call it a demographic. You know, that sounds totally clinical and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the mother's demographic has been really hard to get care for because there's kind of a triple jeopardy of shame going on there. You know, it's not just, I have an addiction now it's, am I a bad mother because I have an addiction and will people take my kids away? You know, what, what will be the consequences of that? So we also have that, that, that we're trying to overcome. So when we made sober buddy, we said, Hey, we want to have something that is emotionally um, accessible, something that uses, you know, an interface that doesn't feel clinical or intimidating. You know, we made it kind of cutesy and fun, you know, game like um, it uses language that is non-shaming. It's all person centered, meaning that it's empathizing with the person who's going through things. You know, it's not like someone on the outside talking to you, like, this is what you must do. It's saying, Hey, this is how we all feel. And this is how we can help you. This is how you get out of this situation. Um, and we made it simple too. You know, we didn't want to be overwhelming. So it's little bite-sized challenges, motivation tips, you know, little memes. And it asks you if you're sober every day. And if it asks you how you're feeling every day, this is my favorite part of the app is it asks you how you're feeling every day. And then based on how you respond to it, it gives you this amazing, empathetic, wonderful response based on, you know, how long you've been sober, what you're using, things like that. But I like using that. (laughs) I even know what they're, you know, some of the things it's going to say. And I'm always like, Oh, thanks buddy. You know, (laughs) I needed that today. So, um, so that's basically what the app is and then how it works. That sounds amazing. Um, and you know, I, I don't have an alcohol issue or, or addiction drugs or anything like that, but I totally want to check out the app anyway. (laughs) It sounds, it, it sounds almost fun. Yes. You know, it's so funny. 
Um, it took us, so we have over like 2000 pieces of content on this app, you know, and, um, it took, I went through and I was editing it, you know, I was editing the content, making sure it all aligned with everything. And cause we have experts writing, you know, sure. experts in addiction, writing the, um, the content. And it took me forever to edit it. Cause I kept doing the challenges. Like <laughs> in my life, I kept like doing the journal challenges. Like, Oh, this is good. I like, I need to like think about this in my life. And it started taking me forever. Right? Cause I would be like, Oh my gosh, I just got so distracted with this challenge. <laughs> I know how that my own life. Yeah. And it's super enriching. Like, and it makes you think so much about like, just how you, about everything in life. Yeah. Like it's not even, it, it's just about a life improvement. You know, our, our like um, mission statement or like our why at Sober Buddy is that we truly believe that you can have a better life than you've ever had before. And that is like our driving motivator. How do you have a better life than you've ever had before? And so then we are like, you need tools. You need like these, this, this, these ladders or the scaffolding to get out of pits that you're stuck in. Right. Mm-hmm. If you're stuck in a pit, you're not going anywhere. But then once you're out, you also need to, to learn how to dream and how to like act on those dreams and make those dreams a reality you know? And so that's our whole motivator with everything that we do is first let's learn how to get out and then let's learn how to dream. And then let's build a life that we've, yeah, that's better than we've ever had before. Absolutely. I I mean, you know, once you, you come out of an addiction or you're breaking a habit to something, you know, smoking, eating, whatever it is, you have to replace that with something. It's not just a matter of saying, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to eat junk food anymore. That's mine. Um, It's okay. I'm not going to eat junk food anymore, but now what am I going to do when the emotions hit or um, the situations hit where that triggers that? Exactly. Or you can even think of it as saying, I'm not going to eat junk food anymore. So you take all the food out of your house and don't put anything else in. You're just going to starve to death and eventually your hunger will take over and you'll go eat whatever's available. (laughs) That (laughs) my kids will revolt. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I feel that. that. (laughs) 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 Yes. We, I know we have one of our big models that I really took from this and I apply in so many areas of my life is um, be smart, not strong. And like that. I know when I first heard it, I was like, I don't understand. And it's basically set your life up in a smart way. So you don't have to always be strong. Right. And I think about, and it's so funny because I think I think about that the most when I'm at the grocery store, (laughs) it sounds so funny, but like, especially like if I'm at Trader Joe's, I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) I'll be like seeing like the chocolate covered nuts and the, and I'll be like, no, be smart, not strong. If you have those in your house, you will eat them all. I they like will. that. I, I'm going to have to write that down and um, put that up with another one that I have that is, um, if hunger isn't the problem, food isn't the solution. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. I got that from another guest. I was like, oh, I need to put that like all over my kitchen. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then also we need to have another big thing, especially with drug and alcohol recovery. But I mean, you could apply yeah. this to any, um, any new challenge you're trying to take and I want to also point out that relationships getting out of addictive codependent relationships are Mm -hmm. also right up there. It's very similar, very, very similar. Um, um, Oh shoot. I just forgot what I was going to tell you. I got, (laughs) I went down, dang it. It was a good nugget too. I know it. Um, It'll come back to you. You know, getting out of those relationships where you're feeding off each other um, is you know, it's so important. I I know they say that you can't sober up and still be with an alcoholic or you can, but it's going to be very, very very difficult. difficult. Yeah. Because especially if that's your point of connection. Yeah. Because ultimately, and this is why, um, you know, meetings have been so uh, pushed because pushed in recovery and, and the reason is, is because ultimately as humans, our most essential need is connection, mm-hmm. right? And that's where so much of our trauma comes from. That's where so much, like 
the big issues in our life come from, we didn't get connection in a healthy way, right? We didn't, something was messed up about it. Something was pushed away. That's where shame comes from is like that pushing away feeling. I'm no longer connected to my community. They've, they've outed me, you know? Um, and so when the people that are closest to you are, are the ones who are uh, perpetuating the bad, you know, the, the mm-hmm. behavior in your life that is hurting you, that does, that is a really big issue. And so that's like why we'll say, um, you know, you need to find, you need to find new friends, you know, you need to find new communities. And the big thing is what if I'm married to the friend that, you know, to the community or it's my parents or whatever. And so what we say to that, and that's, and this is not in a lighthearted way. It is a very difficult thing, but we just say, like, if you're at a point where you just say, this is a life and death issue. And sometimes it is, and usually at that point it is, is like, it it might require some space and it might say, look, if I stay in this, I might die, you know? And so that's, and that's, again, on an extreme case, I, I, I do know people who have been able to get sober and hopefully, um, you, you're able to also just set boundaries and say, Hey, I understand that this isn't the choice that you want to make. Um, but here's what would help me you know, can, can we set like some rules or some boundaries? I want to respect you. And obviously I know that that takes somebody who's willing to work with you. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. You know, there's always levels. There's always levels to everything. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so I kind of want to talk about the stigma around addiction um, and alcoholism because, you know, at one time, it, it, alcohol especially is, it's just, you know, one of those, um, what am I trying to say? So it's social, Mm -hmm. um, it's socially accepted. That's what I was trying to go for. Um, you think of, you know, like in the fifties and the forties, the wives had the husband's martini or scotch or whatever it was ready with his slippers when he walked through the door and she was always a closet alcoholic and you know, (laughs) you see these things and it was just accepted. That's just kind of the way it was. Um, not that I'm saying that's right, but why is, why is it all of a sudden we look at somebody who is, has an addiction, has a a problem with substance abuse, and they're all automatically a bad person instead of they have a problem. They have an illness. It, this is an illness. It's a mental illness. Um, it, you know, it's something that their physical body, they no longer can control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But instead well, we look at them yeah. like they're scum, you know, anytime. Okay. There's something that we've, I've heard the term and I love this term. It's called othering. Mm. And a lot of times stigma comes from situations that we want to distance ourselves from. And usually, I mean, we do a lot of othering around addictions and sexuality mm-hmm. Um, and it's because both of those things are very scary to us because they're things that could overtake any of us and make us out of control. Right. But it's also something that we don't want to give up. So we want to maintain control of it. Right. So we don't want to say, um, I could become addicted to alcohol because then that would mean maybe I have to watch my alcohol. Right. Right. And so we want to say, so those people over there, they're the they're the out of control ones. Right. But I'm not an out of control one. Right. I can right. Or my, I can we become myself. really strict about it. And we say, you know, you know, you can go the other extreme where we become really controlling about the issue. Right. You see that a lot in sexuality where we slut shame or we do all these different things because mm-hmm. we want to say control, control, control. So anytime that there's any kind of a situation where it, it feels so out of our control, then we create a big stigma and it's just a method of control. Shaming is a method of control and it makes us feel safer, you know? And so when it comes to drug and alcohol addiction, you know, at some point, um, I don't know what era it was probably prohibition really. Um, It became like a moral issue, right? There was this under this idea that, you know, if you were just good, you wouldn't have an addiction. 
right? And it became a good, bad thing. Now in the eighties and my co-founder, and actually he's my father, that's a whole Sorry, that's how I got involved in the <laughs> recovery whole, field. Whole other my, uh, episode there. <laughs> yeah, my my uh, father, he was uh, on, on a team in the 80s that were saying, hey, look, this is not a moral issue. This is a mental health issue. We need to bring mental health practices into drug and alcohol recovery treatment. And so they created a, the first evidence-based um, program for outpatient on that. Um, and what that has done is, is bring awareness. Now media has a huge influence on this. You know, I was watching uh, sleepless in Seattle over the, over the holidays I I love seen that movie, movie in forever. And I noticed something, something caught my eye. Uh, Meg Ryan and Rosie O'Donnell. I don't remember their characters' names in the movie. I apologize They're You know, they would get, they get together and they do these like movie nights where they're <laughs> eating popcorn and everything. And I noticed that they're drinking snapples. And I thought that would never be the case in a movie nowadays. It would hundred percent be wine in this situation. Yep. Right. And we've made it, um, very uh, like everybody drinks excessively, you know, we've normalized even addiction. We've normalized the idea of day drinking. We've normalized during the pandemic, you know, we've, we've normalized these things. So we have, this odd thing where we normalize essentially overuse of alcohol. And then we shame people who get addicted. Right. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you can't have both. You can't, you can't do both, you know? So um, I think we definitely need to bring awareness to it. And, and I think we are, I think there's a lot of people working to bring awareness to it. And, you know, it's, as you were talking about that, um, you know, with media and everything, I'm reminded of all the memes and, and things I see around women and wine and, um, you know, having a, like a purse, but the purse is actually like a, a box of wine or, you know, stuff like that. And, and it's almost like the media nowadays is trying to make it, um, like you're, you're one of the cool kids. Yes. Yes. But, and that was like what we would do as teenagers. Right. Yeah. But now it's, per, it's permeated into adulthood and, yeah. um, and don't underestimate the fact that the alcohol companies are behind that. Oh no. You know, Not at all. it's, it's, how do you get, you know, and, and we call it the wine mom epidemic, mm-hmm. right? It's a, it's a thing. It is. It really you know, is. It's a thing. And, and we, and there's a, there's some really awesome people who are taking that on just head on like, um, recovery is the new black. You know, she says, she says a glass of wine is not a motherhood accessory. It's not like a required motherhood accessory. You don't have to like participate, you know? Um, but it's, it's a thing. And I think it's good for us to talk about and bring awareness to, and also what I would say is this, like the pandemic, I get it. I get why moms were day drinking, you know, I get it. I have four children. I get it. Um, but I also think that we can say, let's not let the pandemic, um, ruin us for the rest of our lives, like screw up the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Cause we went there with that, you know, it's like, let's come out swinging and be healthy. And I, and I think having good mental health and having good physical health is a thing that we're all starting to talk about. You know, I think there's a wave of that and we're saying, how do we get healthy? How do we thrive? Absolutely. How do we thrive? I want to kind of pivot a little bit and I want to talk about something that you brought up in the very beginning. And that was um, one of the biggest reasons why people don't get the help or enter the programs is emotion because when you were when you were talking about that in my head it popped financial and mm-hmm. you you come out with emotion and I'm like really I mean I mean I get that you've got to be ready you, you know you, you nobody can be forced to quit or anything like that but um I see in my world so many times people can't get that help because they can't they can't pay for it that is another thing and I, I mean Financial is a huge thing. You know, um, your insurance company has to cover it. Your, 
Um, if they don't, you know, any kind of government program, it depends on what state you're in. In California, I know government programs are super hard to get into. You have these long waiting lists, the and whole process. Even, like, so even if you have all the resources, like they're, they're open to you, it's a very difficult process to get into these programs. Yeah. You know? And so, you know, and you have literally, we know if, if you're in crisis, there's 24 hours. If you don't get help within 24 hours, you're going to give up on that help or you're going to, something could happen. But I think it's important also to realize, you know, we tend to think of drug and alcohol addiction that it has like two, two points. It has like, everything is fine. I'm managing my life. We're good. Or I'm in massive crisis. I've hit rock bottom. Please do an intervention, (laughs) you know, but there's a whole spectrum in between there. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, there's, there's overuse to 26% of American adults are overusers. they qualify for overuse, meaning they drink way too much for the health of their body and mind. So, um, that's a huge portion of the population. And I think we can all, you know, take a look around and acknowledge that it's not like shocking to any of us really. Right. I'm um, sure it pretty much anybody <laughs> listening can name at least one person. That would fall in that category. Right. And, and, um, and there's multiple factors on that, but I think just going back to financial, that is a barrier. That is a barrier. And we need easy, easier tools, you know, with sober buddy, that was a big thing is like it, we want it to be, we want it to not require a whole bunch of emotional energy points to get to, right? Like it's, we want it to be easy. You just pop on, it's private. You don't have to out yourself to everybody. You can go on. It's, you know, you could do a free trial, you know, and then after that, it's really inexpensive. It's less than a bottle of wine per month, you know, (laughs) a cheap bottle of wine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it, um, and it's not, it's automated too. So you also don't have a person who's going to pester you, right? Like it's kind of, it, nice. it's giving you the tools. It's an automated program. And so it's easy emotionally. It's easy financially. It's easy physically. Cause it's on your phone, you know? Right. And even if that ends up being like, you end up saying, Hey, I think I need more help than this. You know, like I, I need a person. You've now entered into that space. You've you started asking yourself the important questions. You've started to reframe your thinking, you know, and that might give you the the brevity to go get a counselor or to go seek out, you know, further care or look for a meeting of other people, you know, or things like that. And so that is a hugely important piece of the puzzle that has just been missing for so long. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Tara, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us today. Oh, I've enjoyed um, it. Thank you this, for having yeah, me. Yeah, this is super, but it just sounds fantastic. Oh, thank um, you. Listeners, I, as you know, I will have all of Tara's contact information in the show notes. I will also put um, the links for Silver Buddy so that it'll just take you right to the app that, or right to your store where you can download it. Uh, so definitely, um, if this is something that pertains to you, check it out. That sounds great. For Thanks sure. for having me and you have a great rest of the day. Absolutely. Listeners, thank you as always for tuning in. Be sure if you're listening from one of your favorite podcast app, you are hitting that like, share, save, subscribe, whatever the buttons are, smash them all. And we'll talk to you in the next show. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss a show. Be sure to check us out on our new socials on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram.